I spent £15,000 on business education from four universities. But 90% of this was useless and it was stretched across thousands of hours. The problem with universities is that you often get some stuffy old lecturer who reads bullet points off a slideshow and they'll charge you a ridiculous amount for this privilege and give you a fancy piece of paper at the end of it. Now don't get me wrong, if you're going to be a doctor or an engineer then university is great, but for me who studied two business masters it wasn't a great investment. One of the first things you get drilled into at business school is Michael Porter's Five Forces framework. Now this has stood the test of time and Porter basically suggests that there are five forces that influence every industry and these can be used to analyse a company's strengths and weaknesses. These five forces are competitive rivals, the power of customers, the power of suppliers, the threat of substitutes and potential market entrants. So let's take a look at the power of rivals and this is where businesses need a moat in order to solidify the position and protect themselves from rivals. Apple's moat is its ease of use and the ecosystem that it uses in order to lock you in and make it difficult to switch when looking at other competitors. It's much harder to switch to a different phone when you're already set up on Apple's iCloud, Calendar and all of your devices are synced into this network. Ryanair's moat is that it invests in lower prices and lower prices give it more volume which it then pushes to my Ryanair to upsell in order to boost returns and it uses these returns to reinvest in the business getting better prices with planes and suppliers and this drives down costs further and then because it has lower costs it attracts more business which it then reinvests and the cycle continues. And the second of the five forces is that a company's suppliers can determine the company's effectiveness. Fewer suppliers means lower costs and greater economies of scale, but too few suppliers and they wield a heavy bargaining chip and you also run the risk of supply chain issues too. And these effects apply exactly the same to a company's customers. The threat of substitution is the fourth of Peter's five forces and this one's an interesting one because substitution doesn't always come from the same industry. For example Flybe and if you're in the UK you'll know this company for its scary propeller planes and Flybe was a code sharing regional airline that struggled not because of other airlines but because trains were actually faster and cheaper so customers were easily able to substitute Flybe's offering and in 2023 the company went bust and ceased operations. The final force in Porter's Five Forces framework is the threat of new entrants who are often attract to the profitability of existing businesses especially when they're high margin which is why businesses need a moat to protect themselves. Big Pharma's moat is that the cost of new drugs is simply astronomical and it takes years and years to develop not to mention most drugs actually fail so to get a new drug into the market is an incredibly difficult thing to do. The second important thing that you need to know if you were working in business or finance is the time value of money. Now this principle states that money today is worth more in the future because it can be invested and the present value or the PV of the money can be found by taking future cash flows and dividing by the discount rate which is often known as the cost of capital or the interest rate. For example the future value or the FV of £10,000 invested in 5 years today is dependent on the discount rate. If we say that this rate is 8% then that's £10,000 times 8% compounded over 5 years which is £14,693.28 and when we discount from the future value to the present value we need to take the future value and divide this by the discount rate. So for example if I offer to give you £10,000 today or £10,000 5 years in the future you probably choose the £10,000 today because in inflation will actually erode the value of that £10,000 today so in real terms it's worth less in the future. Make sure you understand this about present value and the time value of money because we are going to come back to it later. The fourth thing I learned and a relevant one for me because I trade stocks for a living is that board composition can have a huge effect on shareholder value. You need to check a director's effectiveness by looking at their past successes and their past failures. 
How big were these companies? What actions did they have? How did the share price react over time? You also want to check on how many boards these directors sit on, because if a director is sat on 10 different boards, how focused do you think that they're really going to be? Busy directors are less focused, and while it's good to network and sit on two or three boards, it makes sense. If someone is just chasing the paycheck and trying to get on as many boards as possible, that's going to reduce their effectiveness in the board in your company. You might have been one of the unlucky people who had their flights cancelled with British Airways in 2017 and 2018 and when you think about it it's crazy because British Airways is an IT company and at that time not a single director on the board of directors had IT as a competence and it was only in 2019 that the company decided to get a chief information officer and start bolstering its IT infrastructure and protecting against cyber risk. The fifth thing I learned whilst blowing my savings on business education was a good old SWOT analysis which is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats analysis and these are used in order to help guide businesses to be more successful. So for strengths we can look at what resources the company has available and what its competitive advantage actually is. For weaknesses, we can ask where the company can improve, what competitive advantage is it lacking, and what products or services are performing poorly. For threats and opportunities, we can look at regulation, competitors, and consumer trends. For example, a lot of the big tobacco companies have realized that smoking is going to be more and more regulated, and that it's also not cool anymore to smoke and so the numbers of people smoking are actually declining and because of that these companies have decided to jump on vaping which is taking off instead and apparently is cool so do you remember the time value of money because this is a big feature in these two corporate finance metrics npv or net present value discounts all of the project's future cash flows back to the present value in order to see if the project is profitable and if the npv is positive then the project can be considered however npv can be manipulated so you do need to be aware of this the discount rate reflects the level of risk within the project so higher discount rates reflect higher levels of risk but some mining companies in faraway lands like to use discount rates as low as 5% in order to fluff up their NPV numbers. And if you consider that the Bank of England's current interest rate is 5%, what these companies are actually saying is that their project, which is building a mine in some faraway land, is actually the same level of risk as the Bank of England, which is, of course, completely ridiculous. <laughs> so whenever you see a high NPV, don't get excited straight away. Go and check the discount rate because some people do use this deliberately in order to fluff up the NPV numbers. Now the IRR or the internal rate of return is used to determine the profitability of a future project and IRR is the discount rate which brings all of the future cash flows back to the present to zero. So generally when management are comparing the NPVs of two or more projects they should pick the project with the highest IRR because that is the most profitable. So we're back to Michael Porter again and this time it's the generic strategies framework. This is used to analyze a business's strategy which falls into one of four sections. Low cost leadership, cost focus, differentiation and differentiation focus. And any business that fails to choose one of these areas is doomed to strategic mediocrity and possible failure. So the importance of choosing one of these strategies cannot be understated. And probably one of the most important things I learned at university is the value of communication. You can have the world's most beautifully designed slides complete with relevant economic facts, but if you're boring, Nobody's going to listen and nobody's going to care. So whenever you're speaking to someone or giving a talk or making a video like this, you've got to make it easy for the listener to stay interested. Just remember, the best argument in the world is useless if nobody cares. And hopefully you cared enough about this video to continue watching. And if you found it useful, I'd appreciate a like and a subscribe because it really helps me and the channel out. And please let me know in the comments what your experiences of university were. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.